Okay, so <clears throat> last time uh, we uh, finished talking about uh, the goodwill. <clears throat> now at this point in the first section of the groundwork, uh, Kant shifts his focus. Specifically, Kant proposes that we explicate the concept of goodwill. And he uh, proposes that we do so by considering the related concept of duty. And here's Kant, which contains that of the goodwill, though under certain subjective limitations and hindrances, uh, which, however, far from concealing it and making it unrecognizable, rather bring it out by contrast and make it shine forth all the more brightly. Now, let's just begin with two observations about this. First, the concept of the goodwill is broader than the concept of a will that acts from duty. After all, Kant claims that the concept of duty contains the concept of the goodwill. So acting from duty is not a necessary condition for possessing a good will. Uh, if that's not clear to you, uh, notice how uh, a will can be good even when it doesn't act from duty, uh, as when no duty applies in the given circumstances. Just think of uh, choosing items from a menu when you're at a restaurant, right? There's no duty to pick one over the other, say, okay? Second, <clears throat> Kant considers uh, special cases of the goodwill where the goodwill must overcome certain subjective limitations and hindrances in order that the absolute value of the goodwill will shine forth more brightly to common rational moral cognition. And the idea is that in considering the goodwill under certain subjective uh, limitations and hindrances, its value will be clearly distinguished uh, and recognized to be incomparably higher than the value of any gift of nature or fortune, such as, for example, uh, being born uh, with a uh, sympathetic uh, temperament. Okay, so uh, we're going to begin by uh, marking uh, a distinction uh, that's going to be important for this section. Uh, so uh, Kant claims, uh, or, or rather Kant distinguishes between acting in conformity with duty and acting from duty. So let's begin with the first notion. Um, an action conforms to duty just in case, right, uh, it's consistent with what uh, duty requires, okay? Uh, Notice that in order for an action to conform to duty, it's only necessary that the action be compatible with the requirements of duty, no matter how uh, or what the motive was for performing that action. Uh, so for example, if it's a duty to be honest in commercial transactions, the actions of a shopkeeper who charges a fixed regular price for everyone conforms to duty, even if they're motivated to do so out of rational self-interest rather than respect for the moral law. Now, in order for an action to be done from duty, not only must it conform to duty, not only must that action be compatible with what duty uh, requires, but it must be motivated in a certain way. Uh, actions done from duty must be done for the sake of duty and not for the sake of any non-moral incentive such as rational uh, self-interest. Okay, right. <clears throat> now, uh, Kant claims that only actions done from duty have moral worth or moral content. Now, remember, an action done from duty is one consistent with what duty requires, 
but it's also motivated in the right sort of way, right? It's done for the sake of duty and not for the sake of some non-moral uh, incentive. Uh, now, to say that actions done from duty have moral worth or moral content is not to claim that actions that are merely that merely conform with duty but not done from duty have no moral value. Uh, that such actions fulfill the requirements of duty is morally valuable, and so merit approval, or as Hume might put it, moral approbation. Indeed, such actions might even praise, uh, might even merit praise and encouragement just in virtue of conforming to duty, even if they were not done from duty. So the moral worth of an action goes beyond the value that would merit moral approval. Uh, the moral, uh, hang on a second, uh, okay. The moral worth of an action is more uh, than its uh, compatibility with requirements of duty. The moral worth of an action consists in its being motivated in the right sort of way. Specifically, an action only has moral worth if it's done solely from duty. Thus, the moral worth of an action merits not approval, but according to Kant, esteem. And esteem is the recognition of a special worth of character that is a gift of neither uh, uh, nature nor fortune. Now, not all actions of a good will will merit esteem, only those that are done solely from duty in the absence of any other uh, uh, kind of uh, incentive. Now, the notion of inclination plays an important role in Kant's uh, subsequent discussion. Uh, his earlier mention of certain subjective uh, limitations and hindrances was a reference to inclination. Okay, So we're, we're going to have to try to get clearer about what he means by inclination. Now, in a footnote in the groundwork, Kant defines inclination as the dependence of the faculty of desire on feeling. Well, that's not terribly helpful, but in later works, uh, Kant explains further. Uh, specifically, uh, Kant uh, uh, claims that the mind's powers divide into three faculties. There's the faculty of cognition, the faculty of feeling, and the faculty of desire. Uh, the faculty of cognition involves having representations about the world. Uh, the faculty of feeling involves things like feeling pleasure or pain. And in a weird way, the faculty of desire is midway between both of these faculties. Uh, the faculty of desire is, as it were, the mind's capacity to produce an object by means of a representation, okay? Uh, so, uh, um, you think of uh, uh, breakfast, that's a kind of representation. This, uh, uh, <clears throat> you think, wow, that would, that would be good right now. Uh, that, that involves the uh, feeling of pleasure, and that moves you, right, to go fix yourself breakfast, right? So, the faculty of desire uh, that is to bringing about an object by means of a representation uh, involves uh, having a representation of the object accompanied by a feeling of pleasure. Now, sometimes Kant will speak of uh, desire in a kind of generic way, uh, but sometimes he means it in a specific sense, right? In the specific sense, it's a representation accompanied by a feeling of pleasure. Uh, and, and in this specific sense, it contrasts an, with an aversion, right, which is a representation of an object accompanied by a feeling of displeasure or pain. An empirical desire or aversion, the feeling of pleasure or displeasure, is the contingent result of, with, uh, of the way in which this representation uh, in your mind 
uh, affects one's susceptibility to feeling. And when an empirical desire becomes uh, habitual, it's an inclination. And when an empirical version becomes a habitual, it's a desire. And just as desire, right, can be used generically, right, to cover specifically desires and aversions, uh, similarly, inclination has a more general and more specific sense. Uh, in the specific sense, right, it's a habitual specific desire. In the uh, generic sense, uh, it, it's going to include uh, fear as well. Uh, so in, for now, you can just think of an inclination as a habitual desire. Now, following Hume, Kant holds that the regulate, regular operation of habit occurs unreflectively. However, uh, when a person reflects and judges that pleasure is regularly connected with an object, a person takes, as he puts it, an interest in that object. Uh, thus, an awareness of an inclination produces an interest in an object. Now, when the interest arises from inclination, Kant's going to call this a pathological interest. Okay. Now, that's a technical term, right? He's not really uh, um, saying that uh, it's toxic or, or anything. Um, however, uh, interest can, it turns out, arise not only from uh, uh, inclination, but from rational grounds as well. And when it does, it's a practical interest. So in, in the case of a practical interest, a person takes an interest in an object, even if uh, 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 they don't uh, act uh, uh, from interest. Okay. Now, uh, so much for some uh, preliminaries. Uh, now we get to the uh, main uh, topic of uh, this bit of the first section of the groundwork. Uh, namely, Kant puts forward three important uh, propositions. Okay. The first proposition, uh, which we briefly uh, have touched upon, is that an action has moral worth only when it's done from D. Uh, the second proposition, and I'll just read this out for you, an action from duty has its moral worth, not in the purpose to be attained by it, but in the maxim in accordance with uh, which it's decided upon and therefore, and therefore does not depend upon the realization of the object of the action, but merely upon the principle of volition in accordance with which the action is done without regard for an object of the faculty of desire. And finally, we get the claim that duty is the uh, necessity of an action from respect for the law. Okay, so while the content of the first proposition is relatively clear, at least given our earlier discussion, the content of the second and third propositions need further explanation. And that's what we'll, we'll be doing for the rest of this lecture. Now, each of Kant's three propositions are justified on the basis of material called from common rational moral cognition. The second and third propositions uh, depend on the previous propositions and reflection upon the third proposition is going to lead to the first formulation of uh, the moral law, right? In particular, the, it's going to lead to representing the moral law as uh, the formula of universal uh, law. Um, okay, so, uh, let's can, let's begin with the uh, first uh, proposition. Kant's first important claim about duty is that an action has moral worth only when it's done from duty. Now, Kant seeks to elicit common rational moral cognition's assent to this proposition by considering its reaction to uh, four examples. Uh, the first 
uh, example is of a shopkeeper, shopkeeper who has no immediate inclination to not overcharge an inexperienced customer, which is of course their duty, but conforms their actions to duty out of self-interest to avoid a bad reputation. The three following examples all involve comparing two cases where a person performs an action required by a duty, and these uh, that is preserving one's life, acting beneficently towards those in need, or promoting one's own happiness. And in the first case, the person performs the action because of an immediate inclination to do so out of self-preservation, sympathy, or self-love. In the second case, the person performs the action because it's their duty. In each of the cases of acting from duty, the person must either overcome some opposing inclination or must at the very least act without the help of inclination. And Kant's idea is that while the first of these uh, cases where action conforms to duty, uh, uh, but is motivated by an immediate inclination, that will of course elicit approval uh, from a common rational moral cognition. The second of these cases where duty is the sole motive uh, in the absence of inclination or even in the face of opposing inclination, this will elicit esteem. And recall, esteem is only merited by the moral worth of an action. So if common rational moral cognition esteems only actions done from duty, that's good evidence uh, that common rational moral cognition is committed to, uh, to an action having moral worth only if uh, it's done from duty. Okay, <clears throat> now, <clears throat> Notice that the cases that elicit esteem are those in which the person acts from duty, even though there's no inclination to do so or a strong inclination to act contrary to duty. Thus, if Kant held that a good will only ever acts from duty, he'd be committed to claiming that a person only ever has a good will when they lack a non-moral incentive to do their duty. If we further assume we should strive to have a good will, this would commit to Kant, this would commit Kant to holding that we should strive to eliminate all non-moral incentives to do our duty. And this line of thought is plausibly the source of Schiller's satire. Okay, so here's some satirical verse by Schiller, uh, he writes, uh, the first uh, stanza is entitled Scruples of Conscience. I like to serve my friends, but unfortunately I do it by inclination. So I'm bothered by the thought that I'm not virtuous. Second stanza entitled Decision. There is no other way but this. You must seek to despise them and do with repugnance what duty bids you. Now, Schiller's satire, I believe, is unfair. Kant explicitly denies these commitments. Kant does not believe that we should strive to eliminate all non-moral incentives to do our duty. Rather, in the Metaphysics of Morals, Kant explicitly claims that we have a duty to cultivate love, sympathy, and other inclinations that makes it easier to do our duty. Uh, moreover, Kant denies that actions done from duty are done with uh, repugnance. So in Religion Within the Limits of Reason, uh, uh, he writes, uh, he claims that conforming to duty with repugnance reveals a hidden hatred of the law and is the opposite of acting with goodwill. 
Now, I think the line of thought leading to Schiller's satire goes wrong at the very first step. It's not the case that a goodwill only ever acts from duty. Again, a person can possess a goodwill even in circumstances where no uh, duty applies to their action. If you're deciding whether to have vanilla or chocolate ice cream, there's no relevant duty applicable. Nonetheless, in those circumstances, you may nonetheless possess a, a, a good will. Uh, moreover, a divine will, according to Kant, is the good will, even though it's impossible for it to act from duty, uh, since being infinite in nature, it's not subject to subjective limitations and hindrances of finite beings like ourselves. Okay, so <clears throat> let's uh, move on to the second proposition. And again, let me read out uh, Kant's official formulation. An action from duty <coughs> has its, <coughs> excuse me, has its moral worth, not in the purpose to be attained by it, but in, uh, but in the maxim in accordance with which it's decided upon. Now really, Kant's second proposition is two claims in one. There's a negative claim and then there's a positive claim. The negative claim is that the moral worth of an action done from duty does not depend on what it accomplishes. Uh, the, the positive claim says the moral worth of an action uh, done from duty depends merely on its maxim or principle of volition. Okay, so let's begin with the uh, first uh, negative uh, claim. And this clearly parallels a negative claim about the goodwill. Uh, just as the value of a goodwill does not depend on what it accomplishes, so the moral worth of an action doesn't depend on what it accomplishes. This should not be surprising, again, since the concept of duty contains the concept of a goodwill. Uh, Kant says that the negative claim is clear from what has gone on from before. Here, he's partly alluding to the parallel discussion of the goodwill uh, and partly alluding to the discussion of the four examples. Uh, so suppose in acting in conformity with duty, a, person action, a person's action accomplishes some purpose that they're inclined to. According to Kant, this elicits from common rational moral cognition only approval. But in acting solely from duty, a person's action accomplishes no purpose that they're inclined to. According to Kant, this elicits from moral rational cognition, not only approval, but esteem. And since esteem is only merited by the moral worth of an action, it follows that the moral worth of an action does not depend on accomplishing some inclined purpose. Now, if the moral worth of an action doesn't depend on what it accomplishes, then, well, what does it depend upon? According to Kant, the moral worth of an action depends on its maxim or principle of volition. Now, Kant's argument is abstract here. However, I believe the point can be put less abstractly by following Kant's uh, discussion of the four examples. Okay, so when common rational moral cognition esteems an action done from duty, this esteem is merited by the fact that the person acted from duty in the absence of supporting inclination and potentially in the face of opposing inclination. What merits esteem is the person freely chose to do their duty despite certain subjective limitations and hindrances. It's the policy or maxim that they adopted to do what duty requires that elicits esteem from common rational moral cognition and not the uh, 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 
uh, accomplishment of any inclined purpose. Now we'll be talking more about what exactly a maxim is uh, next time, but for now this should do. So it can only be in the maxim of the action that its moral worth resides. Okay, let's talk now about the third proposition. Duty is the necessity of an action from respect for law. Now Kant claims this third uh, proposition follows from the previous truth. Now, strictly speaking, this cannot be right. Since the third proposition involves the notion of respect not mentioned in the first two propositions. However, the third proposition plausibly follows from the first two propositions in conjunction with a positive characterization or definition of respect. Now, Kant claims that acting from duty involves the feeling of respect for the moral law. The feeling of respect arises, and here's a quote, and it comes from this long footnote about respect. Uh, the feeling of respect arises from the immediate determination of the will by means of the law and consciousness of this. So respect, unlike self-preservation, sympathy, self-love, is not an inclination. In acting from inclination, a person attempts to achieve some purpose because they antecedently want to, okay? But a person respects something not because they want to respect it, Rather, a person respects something because uh, they recognize the reasons they must respect it. Thus Kant claims, only what is connected with my will uh, merely as a ground and never as effect can be the object of respect. Okay. This is because respect essentially involves reasons that are potentially distinct from any purpose of uh, inclination that might be achieved uh, by acting. So in acting from duty, a person does their duty, not because they antecedently want to, rather in acting from duty, a person does their duty because they recognize the reasons they must. Uh, this is uh, because acting from duty essentially involves reasons that are potentially distinct from any purpose of inclination. From this, Kant concludes that in acting from duty, a person manifests respect for the moral law. Now notice something odd here. Uh, the object of respect is the moral law. In Kant's sense of the term, one can only respect a person derivatively as an example of the moral law. That is, and as, as an esteemable exemplar of someone who consciously submits their will to the moral law. In claiming uh, that duty is necessity of an action from respect for the moral law, Kant claims that in acting from duty, a person's will is wholly determined by a conscious representation of the moral law and is thus accompanied by a feeling of respect. Okay. Now, Kant's discussion of duty leads him to pose the following question. Now, here's Kant. But what kind of law can that be, a representation of which must determine the will, even without regard for the effect expected from it, in order for the will to be called good, absolutely, and without limitation? Well. Kant's answer to this question is breathtaking and its brevity and import for his answer. In his answer, Kant claims to have discovered a provisional formulation of the supreme principle of morality. Again, here's a quote from Kant. Since I've deprived the will of every impulse that could arise from it uh, uh, obeying some, by obeying some law, nothing is left but the conformity of 
actions as such with universal law, which alone is to serve the will as its principle. That is, I ought never to act except in such a way that I could also will that my maxim should become a universal law. And notice that uh, last uh, line is in effect uh, the formula of universal law. Okay, now how good is this as an argument? Well, Schopenhauer and on the basis of morality, and here's Schopenhauer pictured, criticizes the argument as follows. By disdaining all empirical motives of the will, Kant removed as empirical everything objective and everything subjective on which a law for the will could be based. And so for the substance of the law, uh, he had nothing left but its own form. Now, this is simply conformity to law. But such conformity consists in its being applicable to all, and so in its universal validity. Accordingly, this becomes the subsequence and substance, and consequently, the purport and meaning of the law are nothing but its universal validity itself. It will therefore <coughs> read, <coughs> excuse me, act only in accordance with that maxim through which you can at the same time will that it should become a universal law for all rational beings. I pay a tribute of sincere admiration to the great ingenuity with which Kant performed this trick. Okay, Schopenhauer, what's Schopenhauer's complaint here? Schopenhauer is complaining that the inference from conformity of actions as such with universal law to the formula of universal law is fallacious. Kant's reasoning from the universal applicability of the law, right, the fact that it, the moral law is valid for all rational beings, to the content of that law. But the content of that law, at least as represented by the first formula, the formula of universal law, goes beyond its universal applicability, for it contains, in addition, the idea that I could also will that my maxim should become a universal law. But we've so far been given no reason to think that the universal applicability of law, the fact that it's valid for all rational beings, uh, necessarily involves what we could or could not will. Now, it's plausible that Kant's anticipating here. <clears throat> if rational beings are the authors of universal law, as he's going to go on to claim, then the universal applicability of the law, its validity for all rational beings, would necessarily involve what a rational being could or could not will. After all, authoring a law is a matter of exercising your will. Uh, so perhaps Kant's anticipating uh, some of the ideas uh, associated with his notion of autonomy that's discussed in the second section. Unfortunately, the justification for any such claim is going to be based on the distinctively philosophical arguments of the second section. And this means that Kant can't rely on those claims uh, about autonomy in the first section, since in the first section, he's limiting himself to claims that can be elicited from common rational moral cognition. Again, this unreflective practical knowledge of rational standards. Well, maybe Kant's reasoning is non-demonstrative here. And here I'm thinking about his um, in, invocation and, or, and allusions to Socrates. While he can't demonstrate the formula of universal law follows from its uh, universal applicability solely from premises that can be uh, elicited from common rational moral cognition, maybe Kant's exercising Socratic influence here. Uh, maybe he thinks he need only explicitly state the formula of universal law for common rational cognition to recognize it as the as a representation of the principle 
that it uh, unreflectively adheres to. Okay. Now, uh, Kant's avowed purpose in discussing duty uh, was to explicate the concept of the goodwill uh, that is to be esteemed in itself and is good apart from any further purpose. To what extent, right, uh, has uh, that purpose been achieved? To what extent uh, uh, has he uh, revealed the val absolute value of the goodwill? Well, in acting in such a way that he could also will uh, that one could also will that uh, their maxim be a universal law, a person acts out of respect for the law. Now, Kant writes, though I do not yet see what this respect is based on, this the philosopher may investigate, and indeed, that's going to be one of the topics of the second section. I at least understand this much that it is an estimation of a worth that far outweighs any worth of what is recommended by inclination <clears throat> and that the necessity of my action from pure respect for the practical law is what constitutes duty to which every other motive must give way because it is a condition of will good in itself, the worth of which surpasses all else. <clears throat> Okay, so I think Kant's point is this. The unconditional value of the goodwill, a value that's incomparably higher than the value of any gift of nature or fortune, is manifest in its capacity to be immediately determined by the moral law without supporting inclination or even in the face of opposing inclination. Now Kant underscores this by contrasting the value of innocence and the value of goodness. And this is a normative contrast uh, that he inherits from Rousseau. Though innocence enjoys a kind of splendor and is an object of nostalgia when it passes, it exists in fragile harmony with what duty requires and is easily seduced. Uh, an innocent human being's conformity to duty is contingent and is easily interfered with by what Kant describes as the counterweight of his needs and inclinations, the entire satisfaction of which he sums up under the name happiness. When the demands of duty conflict with the apparent demands of happiness, human ha beings have, and here's Kant again, a propensity to rationalize against those strict laws of duty, to cast doubt upon their validity, or at least upon their purity and strictness, and where possible to make them better suited to our wishes and inclination, that is to corrupt them at their basis and destroy uh, all their dignity, something that even common rational cognition cannot in the end call good. This is something I, I mentioned last time, right? Kant thinks that when uh, 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 the apparent demands of happiness come to conflict with duty, uh, um, uh, human beings have this tendency to make exceptions to themselves, uh, for themselves, right? Um, and this is really what he thinks is the source of wrongdoing. Now, common rational moral cognition is a kind of innocence. How might it protect itself from temptation and avoid corruption? Kant's really making two recommendations here. First of all, common rational moral cognition involves this, again, pre-reflective practical knowledge of the moral law. Now the formula of universal law is a theoretical representation of that law known through reflection. Uh, and here's Kant, common human reason with this compass in hand knows very well how to distinguish in every case what is good and what is evil, what is can conformity with duty or contrary to it. So by appraising actions with an explicit representation of the principle, 
that it implicitly follows common rational moral cognition can resist the temptation to make exceptions for itself and so avoid corruption. Now, <clears throat> why does he think that the formula of universal law can serve as a compass uh, by which common rational moral cognition can know very well what to do? Well, remember the diagnosis for human wrongdoing. It invariably involves making exceptions for ourselves uh, to universal moral law. So when you're tempted to lie to get out of some difficulty, you don't think lying's right. You think oh, lying's wrong, but you know only just this once. I'm going to lie, right? However, what the formula of universal law emphasizes is its universal applicability, and that's straightforwardly inconsistent with making an exception for yourself. That's why Kant thinks <clears throat> it can be. Uh, an effective moral compass uh, for those lost to temptation. Okay, the second way in which uh, 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 way in which common rational moral cognition uh, can protect itself from temptation and avoid corruption is this. Well, just he, he writes, just as wisdom has no need of science, just as wisdom has need of science, not to learn from it, but to gain durability and access to its principles. Again, this is a reference to uh, Plato's Mino. Uh, common rational moral cognition has uh, need of philosophy, not to learn from it, but to gain durability and access to its principles. Remember, common rational moral cognition already knows right from wrong, right? So we're not relying on philosophy to teach us what's right. We don't require philosophy to teach us how to be honest or to be good. What philosophy does, however, contribute is not knowledge of right or wrong, but, uh, 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 but rather uh, uh, it, to gain durability and access to the principles by which uh, uh, we act morally. Uh, thus common rational, if that's true, then even common rational moral cognition can recognize a practical motive to engage in the kind of philosophical reflection uh, that Kant is going to be pursuing in the second section. There, Kant argues that whereas the first formula is best for the appraisal of action, for access to the moral law, the three formulas should be applied to one in the same action, thereby uh, bringing the moral law closer to intuition and feeling. Now, it's not yet clear what Kant means by access to the moral law. Uh, but Kant is at least claiming this much with the formula, with the first formula as an external aid, a person has sufficient means to act in conformity with duty. But by gaining access to the moral law, uh, thereby bringing it closer to intuition and feeling, a person forms a strong desire to do so. Uh, or uh, 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 even though there's no inclination to do so or a strong inclination to act contrary to duty. And in forming such a desire, common rational moral cognition ins ensures, as it were, the durability of its principle, right? Now, gaining entrance to the moral law is a kind of fall from innocence. This can be a painful experience. The nostalgia for innocence lost that many feel after the fall is a manifestation of this. Loss of innocence can be so painful for some so as to breed resentment. Thus Kant attributes misology or hatred of reason to the envy and resentment of those whose innocence has been forever lost. Interpreting access to the moral law as a fall from innocence is confirmed by Kant's 
own account of the Lapsarian myth in uh, religion within the limits of reason. According to Kant, the serpent spoke truly uh, to Eve uh, when he claimed that by eating of the fruit uh, that they would become equal to God. In gaining, uh, recall the, uh, the relevant tree uh, is the tree of knowledge of good and evil. So in gaining practical reason, that is knowledge of good and evil, Adam and Eve become equal to God in the sense that every rational being has equal and unconditional worth. <clears throat> okay, so next time we're going to begin talking about the second section. Now, uh, you'll be forgiven if you're still unclear about the formula of universal law, what it means exactly, or how to go about applying it. <clears throat> Uh, we'll be discussing that in the context of the second uh, section. And the reason I'm putting off that uh, uh, discussion is because uh, it's easier to uh, uh, see in, in the context of the material from the, the second section. So <clears throat> um, we'll be talking about the second section uh, for uh, uh, the next uh, two weeks. Uh, um, and, but the, for the most part, I, I believe uh, what I'll be talking about for next lecture is just the material connected with the first formula. Uh, and in, now, the first formula has two variant formulations. We've seen the first variant, the formula of universal law. Uh, however, uh, Kant discusses uh, how to apply this formula in terms of a variation called the formula of law of nature, because he thinks it's a little bit more intuitive to operate with. Uh, so that's what we'll be discussing uh, next time. Uh, the first formula in its variant, the formula of law of nature, we'll look at Kant's derivation of this formula, then we'll look at how to apply it and we'll be looking at how to apply it in the context of four examples. Now, Kant is going to discuss these examples with each of the uh, form formulations of the moral law. So please pay close attention to those when reading the first uh, section. Okay, that's uh, all I've got for uh, today. So uh, I will uh, see you uh, next time. Thanks very much.